Battling the bottle is an intense and overwhelming battle that many face in their lifetime. Many lose to it and die, or lose everything but their lives to the bottle. The man in this story lost his home, his business, his reputation, even one of his eyes, and was even determined to kill a man. Eventually, he gained more than he lost. Let's get into it. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, where we share the gospel of Jesus Christ through the art form of audio drama. Yes, and that includes sound effects. I'm Timothy Gregory, bringing to you the true story of a man who was skilled enough to play pro golf. If his alcohol addiction didn't ruin his chances and his life, we'll get into that and more on today's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. Also, you want to stick around because later we're going to give the rest of you an opportunity to enter yet another sweepstakes drawing for a prize. No, it's not a cash prize, but it is a prize, and I think it's a prize that you are really going to like if we draw your name. But first, let's get to it, folks. The final part of the classic true story of Johnny Spence. Mrs. Spence? Yes? You can see your husband now. How is he? Lucky to be alive. When they brought him in, I didn't think he would live. They said he was thrown some 70 feet. He, uh, lost a lung because a piece of the steering wheel punctured that and his abdomen. <gasps> oh, my! And five of his teeth were sheared off. His left hand is broken and he has cuts and bruises all over his body. <laughs> it's a miracle that he survived. I've played golf with your husband, Mrs. Spence. And if he didn't drink so hard, he'd still be a great golfer. He'd also be a lot healthier. Last week, we heard how the man in our story was a pro golfer who might have made the record books except for his addiction to alcohol. In this conclusion of his testimony, we'll hear how he sank to the bottom, desiring death. Parental guidance is suggested as violence is part of this true account of Johnny Spence from the classic files of Unshackled. My wife was a saint to stay with me as I repeatedly ricocheted from success to drunken failure into a so-called rest home to dry out. I made thousands of dollars a week selling golf equipment at tournaments around the country, but I couldn't stay sober. High on Nebutal and booze, I had crashed my brand new car into a truck, head on. Three weeks later, I left the hospital. Johnny, you've lost so much weight. Your skin and bones. Ah, I have a cast iron constitution, Dottie. Why don't you stay home from that meeting in Chicago? The pro golfers? No way. I'll be strong enough in three weeks. Besides, I have a deal going to use Miss America in our golf tournaments. Please fly instead of driving. I will, and don't worry. I won't drink. Promise. I managed not to drink on that trip, but my resolve eventually vanished in the face of screaming nerves and pounding headaches. I'd rush to a bar when my shaking hands couldn't lift the glass, and I had to bend over and slurp the drink. Many times I left Dottie at a restaurant or other public places while I rushed to the rest home. They weaned me off alcohol by giving me drugs. But the last step was Demerol, a narcotic. One night at the rest home, a bunch of us were high on Demerol, singing raucously when I threw my arm around a big man's shoulder and he lashed out furiously, plucking out my right eye. Half-blinded with rage and pain, I chased him right through the French windows. <gasps> I'll kill you! I'll kill you! I collapsed on the ground, and a powerful nurse carried me back inside and pinned me down while another nurse injected me with peraldehyde. The doctor put my eye back in the socket, and they rushed me to the hospital. How are you doing, Johnny? How do you expect? They did manage to save your eye. But I'll never see out of it again. You get to come home in a few days. About time. It's been almost 13 weeks. Does it still hurt? Yes. I need something for the pain. Oh, it's 
That's a terrible blow. I'll never play golf like a champ again. I'm sorry, honey. I look like a freak. I'll have to wear dark glasses. You look good to me, Johnny. I'm gonna get that guy. I'm gonna find out where he lives and blow him away with my shotgun. For weeks, I sat in front of his house, a loaded shotgun in my lap. But he'd fled the state and didn't return for more than a year. Meanwhile, I lived on pain meds as I tried to save my business. I told people a golf ball had struck me in the eye. But I drank more and worked less as I went from one clinic to another. Once I became so violent, they put me in a straitjacket. In desperation, I sold property and equipment to pay for my drinking, drugs, and cures. When I ran out of things to sell, I borrowed from guys at tournaments. Hey, Johnny, what's up? I need cash fast. Uh, you loan me a couple hundred dollars? How about selling me that trailer instead? Okay. I'll let you have it for three thousand. I'll give you a thousand bucks. I paid seven thousand. You crazy, man? You're walking away from the best offer you'll get. Okay. I'll take a thousand. The offer's down to seven fifty and dropping fast. <laughs> okay, friend. You win. Let me have the seven fifty. That money kept me in the rest home five days. Then I called Dottie to pick me up. As soon as we arrived, I gave myself a dose of peraldehyde and fell asleep. In the night, I woke up to Dottie's moans. She was having a gallbladder attack so painful, she had called my mother who lived next door to us. But my only concern was finding the bottle of peraldehyde. My older brother was also there. Calm down, Johnny. Not till I find my medicine. Where is it, Dottie? I don't know, Johnny. Oh. You hid it from me, you and Mom. No, no, we didn't. Get up and help me look. Uh. Let her alone. Uh. Can't you see she's in terrible pain? Mom called an ambulance for her. I want that bottle with my medicine. Let go of me, Johnny. Help me find it or I'll shove you down the stairs. Are you insane? Where is it? All right, I warned you. Oh, no. Oh, oh. Oh. You hit a new low, Johnny. You're all trying to kill me. Well, I'll kill all of you first. I grabbed my shotgun out of the closet and pointed it at Mom, standing at the foot of the stairs. She ran outside, and I followed, prowling through the dark like a rabid dog. Finally, I went back to the house. The ambulance had arrived, but someone had called the police. As I stood over my wife, he hit me from behind, and I woke in the same hospital as Dottie. She was in surgery. I was in a straitjacket. I wanted you to know that Dottie came through the surgery okay. Fine. Now tell them to take off these shackles. I won't tell them how to handle you, Johnny. Let me out of here! I'm in pain. I need something for the pain. You're the pain. If Dottie knows what's good for her, she'll quit making excuses for you. Son, brother, you are. Get out of here and leave me alone. Gladly. And you leave Mom alone, you hear? She's prayed for you all your life. And I think she's wasting her time. As soon as the restraints were off, I walked out and went home. Mom pleaded with me to turn to God. I turned my back on her, went out and sold Dottie's car to buy drugs. When that was gone, I mortgaged the building where I had my showroom and two apartments. That money, too, went for drugs. In May 1958, the rest home kicked me out because I was completely broke. Thanks for sharing your bottle with me, Don. All the guys won't give me the time of day after all I did for them. And say I blame them. Look at me. Muddy shoes, hole in my trousers. Must have fell down somewhere. Oh, I'm just a bum. Nothing but a bum. I decided to end my life at the river. But first, I wanted to see my old club again. So I walked to the house of a man for whom I had done many favors. Johnny? Look, I don't want anything from you. No money or anything, but... Will you please give me a ride across the river to my old club? Uh, wait, I I'll, I'll get the car. 
Johnny, I, uh, I hear what's been going on. Yeah, you ought to be in a government hospital. You were in the Army, and the VA hospital will take care of you. No. Well, then, what are your plans? Plans? None. Except I'm not coming back across the river. Shocked in the silence, he said no more until we got near my old club. I hadn't eaten in more than a week and wondered how I'd have the strength to walk down the river. You had to open the door for me. Yeah, help me get out. Look, Johnny. I'm not gonna leave you here in the mud and rain. You can't even stand up. Well, let me take you to the VA hospital. All right. Everything went black, and I awoke in a barred room with a guard watching me through a peephole in the door. My hands were shackled to the side of the bed. Stupefied and weak, I watched with my one good eye as the door opened and a doctor and nurse floated toward me. They must have thought I was in a coma. An IV is all we can do for a nurse. A little nourishment. I think you better call his family. And then call the chaplain. I don't think he's gonna make it. He's... dying. Folks, we'll get back to Johnny's story in just a moment, but first, I want to share a bit about how our ministry is able to bring hope to people all over the world. Unshackled is now in its 71st year of spreading the good news through powerful stories about real people. Our success is a result of God's blessing and the involvement of, well, supporters like you. When you contribute to Unshackled, it has a direct impact. Your support allows us to hire quality writers, talented actors, as you can hear, a skilled production team, and a devoted staff. Through your support, we're able to share Unshackled worldwide. So, in order to continue the work of spreading the gospel and allowing us to offer this program for free, won't you consider making a donation to Unshackled? It's really quite easy. All you need to do is click on the live link, if there's one where you're listening, or visit our podcast website at unshackledpodcast.org. That's unshackledpodcast.org, and then click the donate button. Or you can always write a check, Unshackled, we take checks. You mail that check to 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. We thank you for your partnership in our ministry, and now back to the final part of the classic story of Johnny Spence. <laughs> Mr. Spence, I'm the chaplain, and I'd like to have a word with you. No chance. Get away from me. I, I want to pray for you. No, don't waste your time. Let's pray to God to help you. If there is a God, he turned his back on me a long time ago. So leave me alone and get out of here. Please. Go all right. But it won't do any good. I'm not worth it. Yes, you are worth it. Father in heaven... I ask you to give this man the desire to live. Let him know, God, that you never turn your back on anyone. This man isn't as bad as I was when you saved me. I was such a horrible sinner. Father, since you saved me, I know you can save him. I had never heard a preacher refer to himself as a sinner. I was shocked. Tears rolled down my cheeks as he finished. I told him about my life, how my father had abandoned us when I was 14, how I had turned away from God when I began to play professional golf, how I became a drunk, addicted to drugs, the whole sordid story. Look to Jesus, Johnny. Try to pray and I'll pray for you. After he left, the God removed my manacles and I tottered to the window. Stars twinkled in the sky. Oh, God, I hope you're real. Tonight I know I'm going to die. I can feel it. I've been a burden to everyone anyway, but before I die, will you do this for me? My mother will be coming out here. She's 
the only one who hasn't forsaken me. If you'll just clean me up so I won't shake or cry, then whatever time is left, I I'll stick to you. I don't want any more whiskey or dope. I just want to tell her that I'm cleaned out. She's prayed for me for so many years. Won't you please help me tonight? I taught her back to bed and collapsed. When the night nurse came with morphine, I refused and asked her to pray for me. She got down on her knees right there and prayed. In spite of the withdrawal pains, I slept. And in the morning, my first visitor was the chaplain. There's something I want you to read. Uh, too weak to read. I'll bring it closer. Now read Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Hold on to that promise from God. I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Johnny, would you go to the chapel tonight? We're having a prayer meeting. They won't let me out of confinement. I'll take care of that. The speaker is a former golf student of yours, and I'd like you to hear him. Well, he doesn't want to see me. Yes, he does. He brought me a wheelchair and wheeled me into a ward. That evening, I struggled out of the chair and lurched my way toward the chapel from one corridor to another until I took a shortcut outside. There, I fainted, but no one noticed. And when consciousness returned, I got back on my feet and approached the chapel. I could hear the speaker, a man I had often mocked. Nothing in this world compares with the love of God poured out through his son. Nothing. So don't be deceived by false idols. Whatever the world offers is a pale substitute for knowing the Creator. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? My mother had quoted that verse to me years before when I turned away from God to play professional golf. My heart was pierced as I continued to stagger toward the chapel. Finally, I reached the door. You see, at the cross, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Jesus Christ paid the penalty for your sin and mine with his righteous blood. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. If any of you are suffering from fear or anxiety or any other ailment, turn it over to God. Let Jesus Christ take your burden. He said in Matthew chapter 11, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Raise your hand if you want to repent of your sins and receive him as your savior. Unable to open the door, I pressed against the screen and then raised my hand. He saw me and strode down the aisle to where I leaned. He opened the screen door and peered at me. Aren't you Johnny Spence? Yes. Yes, I am. Did you raise your hand? Yes, I did. Do you mean business with God? Yes. I mean it more than anything in this world. Thank you, God. Oh, thank you. I've been praying for you, Johnny, for more than eight years. He had been praying for me, but that night, I prayed for myself, and God heard me. I had ridiculed this man for years and thought he hated me. That night, June 20th, 1958, we became brothers in Christ, and we sat in the chapel for hours while he counseled me. Johnny. The Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Well, that must be true. I don't even want to drink anymore. That's really new. God changes our desires. It's amazing. It's called the new birth, being born again of the Spirit of God. I could only have my sight back. 
sometimes we have to live with the consequence of our sin. But God will give you the grace to do that. He says his grace is sufficient for us and his strength is made perfect in our weakness. What exactly is grace? God's favor. None of us deserves it. But he shows himself strong on our behalf. He resists the proud but gives grace to the humble because he wants us to depend on him. What happens if I fail? We all fail. But the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you think he can really love someone like me? Of course. Johnny, he demonstrated his love by sending his only son to die for our sins. He took me back to my room where the night before I had wanted to die. Now I was filled with peace, joy, and eternal life. Four days later, I was discharged. I wasn't healthy, but alcohol and drugs were history. I went to see Dottie. You're still awfully thin, Johnny, but you look rested. I'm saved, Dottie. I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. Your mom told me. Her prayers were answered. I'm not the same, Dottie. I don't know if you can see the difference yet, but I have a new life. I can see something in your face. You seem more peaceful. I made so many promises I didn't keep. I'm so sorry. I wish I could make it up to you. Well, we have the rest of our life. Does that mean you're willing to try again? Yes, Johnny. Fourteen weeks later, I hitchhiked to Charlotte to hear a famous evangelist. We had met before on the golf course, and he spotted me waiting by the back entrance of the Coliseum. He invited me to his dressing room, where we talked. No, I get it. There's so many other things that pull on you in the professional sports world. I've spent my life in places where people don't know him. They would listen to someone like you because you understand them. I heard about your conversion, and many people say it won't last. I know that it will last, if it's real. It is. Johnny, would you be willing to give a brief testimony of how the Lord saved you during the meeting tonight? Oh, I couldn't do that. I I'm so new to... Are you ashamed? No, sir. I promised God that I'd never be ashamed to live for him or to tell what he has done for me. The Lord will give you the right words to say, Johnny. I remember reading that in my Bible. Then will you trust him to lead you? Yes, I will. Good. Let's pray. Nearly 15,000 people crowded into the Colosseum that night, but I wasn't nervous as I told them how God had saved me and changed my life. Then my evangelist friend preached a sermon, telling them about the salvation that Jesus our Savior offers to everyone. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Every sin brings death, separation from God, and there is no way to erase your sins. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. My friend, it was God's great love that sent Jesus to the cross so you could go to heaven. You can't earn your way. Heaven, eternal life, is a gift. All you have to do is repent, turn from your sin to the living God, and receive God's gift. From that night, I traveled and gave my testimony wherever I was invited. One day back in Columbia, I went to see Dad. He was sitting on the porch in a rocking chair. Why, well, hello, Johnny. Hello, Pop. I thought it was about time I came to see you. I'm glad you did, son. What are you doing these days? Just working for the Lord. I don't quite understand. Well, I go wherever I'm invited and tell people how miserable my life was until Jesus saved me. I hope to help those that are here. You get paid to do this? Well, I don't charge them, but I go on faith, depending on God to provide for me. I see you brought a Bible. Yeah, I, uh, I'd like to read you something that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. Okay. 
Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Son, you stick by that Bible pretty close? Pop, I live by it, because I know God loves me and is the only way that I can find the right paths in life. I have to go now, but... Do you mind if I have a word of prayer? Go right ahead. Father in heaven, thank you for letting me see my dad. God, you created both of us. When he left home, it broke my heart, but I love him as much today as I ever did. And if he will open his heart and life to you, Lord, then I'll see him in heaven in the resurrected body you promised all of us who believe in Jesus Christ. I know that all of your promises are true, and I thank you, God, for including me. As I stood up to leave, my father, who had never shed a tear that I saw, was weeping. He told me he had also come to the Lord earlier. I never saw him conscious again. Four weeks later, he died of a stroke. Since my salvation, I have never played golf in the Lord's day. I would go to the end of the earth to tell others about Jesus who set me free of alcohol and drugs. Some say addiction is a disease, but I say it's sin. And only God can set you free of sin. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Listening friend. Jesus Christ will set you free of whatever has you bound when you turn to him. If you've never put your trust in Christ Jesus as Savior, why not do so now? If you need help making this crucial decision, or you want to be connected with resources that can help you, get in touch with us here at Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607 or call 1-888-NEED-HIM. Now, we love hearing from our listeners here on the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, so send us your questions and we'll answer them here. It can be something you're curious about or just something you want to share with us. All you have to do is write us at podcast at unshackled.org or call and leave us a message at 312-281-1264. We'd love to hear from you. Now, before we get to our sweepstakes drawing info, I just want to remind you to subscribe or like our Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. You can even share it or tell a friend. We'd also love for you to review or rate our podcast, and don't forget to check out our other podcasts on this same platform, Unshackled Daily Devotionals and Unshackled in Person. We appreciate your input and involvement in our ministry. And again, please consider supporting us so we can freely offer quality Christian programming to the world. All right, the prize for this sweepstakes contest is another beautiful wooden scripture plaque. And it's John 1.29, which proclaims, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That's wonderful, isn't it? Well, this plaque is gorgeous, especially if you're looking for daily inspiration from Scripture. You will love this authentic and very unique wooden plaque. The plaque has been sawn from a tree branch. Sawn? Is that a word? Well, it is now. Or log, and cut into such a way to retain as much of the bark around the perimeter as possible. And the bark around this one, well, it's gorgeous. This plaque has been handcrafted around the the natural character and beauty of the wood that God created. Now, if you'd like a peek at this scripture plaque, just visit our podcast website, unshackledpodcast.org, and stop by the audio drama page for a picture. 
Unfortunately, we're only able to mail this plaque to locations within the United States, so our drawing is limited to U.S. addresses. But if you reside in the U.S., all you have to do to enter our sweepstakes drawing is call 312-281-1264 or email podcast at unshackled.org and give us your name, phone number, and email. Your name, phone number, and email. The winner of the sweepstakes for this beautiful scripture plaque will be announced June 27th, but the deadline for entry is June 11th. We look forward to hearing from you. And next time... I'm tired of sneaking around, Dawn. I know. Look, I want to be with you all the time. Me too, Brennan. Dawn Doth kept searching for connection in the world. No, Dawn's not here right now. Yeah, I know this is her cell phone. Uh, uh, Brennan, who is it, honey? Yeah, well, she didn't want to talk to you. Brennan... <gasps> You're with me now. When she turned to others to seek validation, she wound up feeling worse than before. I can't get to sleep, Kate. It always helps to talk to you about it. You always know what to say to calm me down. Dawn, you can't call here at all hours. My family is trying to sleep. Now enough is enough! But she had to look up to find someone she could really count on. All this time, I've been depending on the things of this world to fix my pain. I'd rather die than go back to my old patterns of living. Change me. Another testimony. The true story of Dawn Doff. Soon on Unshackled. Heard in the classic true story of Johnny Spence Part 2 were Stephen Spencer, Elizabeth Argus, Demetrius Troy, John Green, and Jim Craig. Original music, Don Badorf. Sound effects, Demetrius Troy. Sound assistant, Martin Robinson. Recording engineer, David Pierczynski. Audio engineer, Michael Kahn. Script, Kenitha Gabler and Jack O'Dell. That's it for this week's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. So until next time, unless our Lord returns before then, I'm Timothy Gregory, your brother in Christ.